Now he's out of the domain of the natural. Now there's, let's, I'll transition to the Buddhist because that's very important. Um, flesh is not bad. It is not evil. By the way, it's not the same thing as meat. It, it isn't the stuff on your bones, right? And so there are a whole lot of confusions here that might be addressed. But your flesh is simply your natural abilities. It's what you can do without assistance, direct assistance from God. Of course, indirectly, you couldn't do anything without God anyway. But direct assistance. So you see that over and over in the New Testament and, and in the Old Testament. But does, flesh is not bad. We couldn't live without it. Same thing is true of desire. The only desire enables us to live. A little child comes into this world would die if it had no desires. And old people, as they lose their desires, often wish they were dead. Uh, so desire is not bad. But desire is obsessive, and it does not consider the broader scene. That is the role of the will, which acts, is supposed to act for what is good and not just what is wanted. See, love puts us in the domain of what is good, and the will is supposed to follow that. Now, Buddhists and Stoics have taught that you need to eliminate desire. And the first thing to say about that is anyone who thinks they have done that is under an illusion. You cannot eliminate desire and live. But desire in itself is not wrong. It's not to be eliminated. It is to be subordinated to what is good. And then desire is fine. See. But if it's not subordinated to what is good, it will tear you apart. So you have passages like James 4, where do wars and fightings come from? It term, comes out from your pleasures and your desires. Desire is essentially conflictual and you experience that in yourself. And you say, boy, I'd really like to have that Maserati. And then you find out the price. Desire is conflictual. It has to be subordinated to good. And always remember, don't use love, desire and love in the same way. They don't mean the same thing. You may say you love chocolate cake, but you don't. You want to eat it. <laughs> That's very different from love. I mean, you could imagine someone who just took care of chocolate cake. <laughs> but you'd think they were nuts, right? And they would be. So you always have to keep love and desire in two different sections. And understand that love is subordinated to good. Desire is simply a matter of, I want that. And you see it most vividly in children because they're not able to compare. And you know how they, they see a trinket and they want to blow their allowance on the trinket. And you're standing there saying, now you don't want that. And the child is saying, oh, I want that. And then finally you may give in and 15 minutes later the trinket is broken and the child turns to you and says, why did you let me buy that? Have you seen that? They do that. That's their process of learning the difference between what you want and what is good. Right. Yes. Um, I'd love to draw you out more on the means of scripture memorization in a congregational context. Yes. Do you feel like there needs to be an indication that an individual wants more, or is there a way to promote scripture memory for an entire group of people who are at a variety of places? Right. And based on that answer, what would be some additional practical means of promoting memorization? Uh, this comes in stages. Uh, any discipline that you're going to practice and any commandment that you're going to teach people how to do, you want to have general teaching in your congregation. And then the congregation will sort itself out. This is my experience. Some people will say, uh, I don't want to go there. Now you find people who, if you had a pill that they could take, and never bore, be angry, they wouldn't take the pill. See, they're wedded to it. 
So if you say, well, let's lay aside anger, you're asking them to lay aside a primary instrument by which they negotiate life. So you teach. Now you teach. People are not, many of them are just going to want to memorize scripture to memorize scripture. So you present it in the context of what that does for them. And then some of them are going to say, I'm ready for that. And some of them you can deal with individually, but I would always press for a group because they do encourage one another and they learn better in a group. You don't have to have a large group, three or four people, and let's say that they decide they would like to memorize. Don't start them on the Sermon on the Mount. It'll kill them. Uh, so, you know, start them on something. Mm, 1 Corinthians 13 is great to start on. Um, or one of the parables of Jesus or something of like that. Because many of them need to know they can do this. And you teach them that you memorize the th three things involved more or less in memorization, repetition, concentration, understanding. And if you don't have those three, it's going to be hard. Some things you'll memorize just by understanding them. You have memorized many things that way. But probably not a, a long passage. So there you need repetition, but if you don't have concentration, your repetition will not do as much good. Now, you actually can memorize just by repetition, because in the end it becomes a bodily habit, and it comes out of your body. But it's not best to do it that way. Repetition, concentration, understanding, those three things. So you lead people through that. And then you can use, you know there are some very good resources on this. There's an organization of long-standing called Bible Memory Association. Any of you know that? It, it is a set-up program of memorization with little booklets. And what you do is you have groups in church. Unfortunately, it's often done just for young people. That's wonderful, but old people need it too. And then you have people in the church who hear the recitation, if you wish, of the passage or the verse um, at set times, like every two weeks or a month or whatever. And uh, it's very nicely organized. The, uh, the only drawback that I see to it is the passages are not long enough. And I want to tell you, you can't get the benefit just by memorizing verses. It just doesn't work that way. And when you try it, you, you'll see why that is. Um, and um, so I think the passages, some of the passages at least should be longer. And uh, you might want to select different passages because of the profundity of that particular passage. So um, that's the sort of thing I would work on. I, as I said in one of my books, I think, and it comes back to me often, if I were, I would not pastor a church that did not have a memorization program uh, and leading people into that. Uh, young people, you know, tend to memorize and remember what they memorize forever. Not perfectly, perhaps, but they will know it's there somehow. And so that's very important. But everyone needs to be memorizing, and that's a primary way that you renew your mind. Because when you memorize, that becomes a part of what you think of and how you think about it, those two things. So that's a little bit Thank you. Uh, we're over here first. Uh, it sounds like uh, what you memorized as a young person was oh, the did. KJV. Yes, that's why it Maybe almost, you still use it today. Well, uh, it almost always comes out in King James for yeah. me because... <laughs> Please. I have a really practical question for you. Some of us have had an interaction, say, with youth groups that were part of quizzing teams or whatever. And maybe we've known kids who could memorize, they had memorized the Gospel of John and the Book of Acts, and they could answer some question immediately, and they couldn't wait to use their quizzing opportunities as ways to show off, and, and then they couldn't wait to leave those quizzing activities to go act immorally. It didn't seem like it was anything close to sort of an automatic, you know, you get a lot of scripture memory yeah. and yeah. then it just works this way. So just 
bluntly, what's going on there in your estimation, yeah. or, or or what well, what's missing, maybe? Let me see. Let me say something, and you see if I'm right about the cases you yeah. know. Uh, these are cases where memorization is not tied to character development, yep. and usually these are situations where people have a high view of scripture, yeah. and that's wonderful. But they think just on the basis of holding a high view of scripture, they should memorize. I myself don't think that that's helpful. I think what you want to s you have before you is, I am first a disciple of Jesus. As a disciple, my life is organized around character transformation, and scripture memorization can be a way of assisting that. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessary. Again, it's very important because often you have uh, young people, perhaps older people, who come to think that memorization is righteousness. And you have just brought forth a brilliant illustration of why it's not, <laughs> right? And uh, so anytime a discipline is tilted in the direction of self-righteousness or superiority, then something has gone wrong and you need to practice some other disciplines. Like, for example, an excellent discipline for uh, this kind of pride is service, and especially serving people you don't think are worthy. And uh, young people can learn a lot from that. And you can tell them about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples and give them the meaning of that and uh, help them to serve. And serving other people is a wonderful way of curing uh, the attitude of superiority. Please. Yes, sir. Dr. Willard, um, I'm from the 70s, so something you said just blew my mind. You said the flesh is not bad. Right. And, and I'm, all kind of things went through my mind in terms of passages of Scripture and the New Testament that say that it is, that it's terrible, that it wars well, against the Spirit. That it's, we need it's, to sit down and look at those passages, but go ahead. But, but, but help me, just help me out with that. because um, I, so The flesh becomes inhabited with sin. That is to say, the natural abilities of people are taken over by practices of sin. And then the flesh is bad. But not because it's flesh. It's because it has been inhabited by sin. So Paul can say that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Right? But he, then he also teaches us that our body is the temple of God and that our natural abilities can be redeemed. And so, for example, we also know that the Spirit of God will be poured out upon all flesh. And the flesh, if it is not inhabited by sin, which of course it always is until it's redeemed now because we're a fallen race, as we say. Uh, and, but it's good, it's what God has created, and without it, we wouldn't have human life. So then, so you're saying then that this, this battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit then is just um, bringing the flesh into conformity to, to the right. ways of God. That's right. Okay. okay. Uh, so now many people feel that that can't be done. And those are often people who think that the, process, the proposal of spiritual transformation is impossible. So we have a lot of folks in our fellowships that believe that. And uh, they will tell you that Mother Teresa of Calcutta and Hitler are basically the same. They just act differently. So uh, that's a really important point uh, because it has caused so much trouble throughout the ages. And, um, and also the misunderstanding of the, f the flesh isn't, your, isn't meat, it isn't your body. So actually, the flesh which sin inhabits is not your body. It's your abilities, not your body. Your body is not bad. See, that's one of the things that has gotten offloaded onto so much of Christian history and spirituality. Is the, the, the body is bad. It's evil. And even that to punish it is good because it deserves it, or something of that sort. So these are just a nest of confusions we really have to get past. 
Thank you. Uh, there was one over here. Okay. And I'm sorry, this will have to be the last one.